Hi everybody, I hope that you all are doing well today. This is week 8. Um, we just have one more live stream after this, and then we are completely done for the term, which is crazy. Um, today we're going to be talking about plant form and transport, and I'm just going to jump right in. So number one asks, how is the general morphology of the various organ organs of a plant correlated with the functions of those organs? For example, why are leaves generally thin and flat? What structural advantage is provided to stems that have their vascular tissue arranged in a ring near the periphery of the stem? And finally, what characteristics of roots and root growth dictate that the vascular tissue be more centrally located? So for this question, I'm just going to dissect it piece by piece. The first part is asking about leaves and their structure. Leaves are flat and thin, which means that they have high surface area to volume ratio. And this means that they maximize the surface area to expose those photosynthetic cells to sunlight. Um, and their large surface area contain many stomata, which um, stomatas are found in the pores of the epidermis of the leaves. Um, they can also be found in stems and other organs that control gas exchange, but um, mainly they are found in the leaves, which allow for a gas exchange that is associated with photosynthesis. And then um, moving on to some stems. Often the strongest tissue of the stem, the xylem and phloem, are organized around the peripheral. Um, to draw a picture, what this means is that um, the xylem, and this is not exactly what it looks like, this is just what it's um, talking about in terms of what it means by periphery. And that just means that it's more, it's centered, um, it's located more towards the peripheral side of the stem. And this is important because it helps with the rigidity of the stem, it helps with the support, um, and is necessary for plants to be able to maintain uprightness. Awesome. And then finally, discussing the roots, um, in contrast to stems, their roots, the roots, um, their strongest tissues, the xylem and phloem in the roots is centralized and not found in the periphery. Um, what this does, it makes the roots more malleable in terms of kind of their size are more squishy. They're able to grow, grow around obstacles in the ground. They're more able to bend. They're more flexible um, rather than rigid as we're seeing. So if I were to contrast, let's just think that maybe the xylem is here. 
and the foam is here. Phylum and foam and centralized. So that's just the general morphology um, correlated with the plant structure recovered leaves, stem, roots, and where their tissues are found, why, how it relates to function. Leaves have a very high surface area for gas exchange and photosynthetic um, cell exposure. Stems have xylem and phloem, and I just realized I forgot an H, and both. Phloems. <laughs> Xylem and phloem are located peripherally, so that provides rigidity and support. And then roots, they're more centralized to allow for more flexibility. Cool. So moving on to two and three. How do water's properties of adhesion and cohesion help maintain the flow of water in the xylem of a plant? A lot of adhesion and cohesion deals with water potential, and we'll talk more about that um, in question three and four. But adhesion and cohesion are important because adhesion occurs when the water molecules cling to the xylem tissue, so it's adhering to something other than itself. And cohesion, which you think of like things coming together, Cohesion occurs when water molecules stick to one another. So when you have both combined, um, it helps with the flow of water up the plant. So they water molecules cohere and adhere to the sides of xylem vesicles. And so um, just remember here that negative pressure is also playing a role where um, you have more positive pressure closer to the roots and uh, the more negative pressure you get towards the atmosphere. And so negative pressure is applied and pulls the water up the, the xylem. And along with that, each water molecule is, it, is cohering to each other, so as it's being pulled up and as it's adhering to the xylem, it's attached and co cohesive with the other water, and so it's going to pull up another water molecule, and the next molecule, and the next molecule. So that's how the entire water column rises, is because it's a cohesive unit and they um, are attached through hydrogen bonding. Negative pressure, not potential. Okay, moving on to 3A and B. A, if water flows from a region of more positive or higher water potential to a region of more negative or lower water potential, 
How does the water potential in the root compare to that in the soil outside the root? If we're saying here that higher water potential moves to lower water potential, and we know that water moves from the soil to the root, then we would say the soil has higher water potential than the root. And that is why water flows through. So let's write that down. Does the property of water change? Here, let me finish this. Let me write this down because I know that I will not finish the sentence if I don't do it right now. <laughs> Soil is higher than the root. Okay. So the question is asking if the properties of water change if the plant is in a different environment. Um, that's a really good question and I can't say that I know the exact answer, but I would assume not. What I think might change is the rate of transpiration. For example, um, plants like aloe or things that live in desert er areas with um, a lot of sun for a lot of the day, then the transpiration of that plant might be higher. And there's things like C4 plants and things like that to kind of keep water together, but it doesn't actually change the property of the water itself. Um, the adhesion and cohesion through the plant, I would assume, would stay the same no matter what the um, environment would be, but I think you'll, you'll see the adaptations to environment through things like thickness of leaves or where those stomata are, if it's in a closed chamber, when do they do their gas exchange, when do they do their respiration, is it at night, during the day. Um, so I'm sorry that's not a more direct answer, but I hope that that helps with that question. Let me know if it does not, and I will do more research. Okay, cool. So B, how does the water potential in the air compare to that in the leaf if a plant is undergoing transpiration? Um, if transpiration is occurring, then the air must have a lower water potential than the leaf. And water potential can feel tricky because it's coming from the ground up and you're thinking about gravity and how that would it normally work. But just think about how in biology um, diffusion is high to low. Uh, a lot of things naturally like to go from higher concentration to lower concentration. Um, and so they're just happen that lower end of the spectrum just happens to be in the atmosphere rather than the ground. Awesome. Okay, so four, we're going to get into using the equation for water potential and answering some questions. Um, I wouldn't get too lost in the weeds with this. It can seem a little bit more complex than it is, but a lot of the times um, it's a, a simple addition. Here we'll be doing some multiplication, but I, oh, let me get this down for you guys, can't see. Um, I assume that a lot of it will be addition just to see which way water is flowing. So to not make you more confused, you know, further confused, let's just jump into it. So a student uses an AUB tube for a series of experiments. Sides A and B of the tube are separated by a membrane that is permeable to water but not to sugar or starch. So I think they're just, that was not a nice tube. All right, this one's not nice either, but that's fine. So they have parts A and B.
and water can move through. Um, but molecules cannot, so they would just stay on one side. Um, besides A and B, blah, 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 what results would you expect under the experimental conditions given below? Explain your answers in terms of osmotic potential, water potential, and the equation seen here. So, just to hit that solute pressure is always negative, and 0.1 mole of solution of any substance has a solute pressure of negative 0.23 and this is what we'll be using in multiplication that I said earlier it's just going to be a simple conversion factor and then addition so therefore a 0.2 molar solution would have the solute pressure of negative, two, negative 0.23 times 2 which is equal to negative 0.46 so they're just showing you that conversion that we'll be using Experiment A. Experiment A. A solution of 10 grams of sucrose and 1,000 grams of water. The molecular weight of sucrose is 342 grams. Is added to side A. So this side, not where I drew the molecules. <laughs> An equal volume of pure water is added to side B. What will happen to the concentration of water and sugar in the two sides over time? Explain. So first we have to, we're given our um, unit of sucrose in grams and we want to con switch that over to moles because that is what we use in our equation. To do that it's giving us our molecular weight of 342 grams. Therefore our first step would be to divide 10 grams of sucrose that we're getting, getting to 342 grams per mole and this is just equal to 0 0.03 it would be 0 0.0342 but I'm just rounding it to 0 0.03 um, and that is moles of sucrose we would then use this mole of sucrose and multiply it by that factor so we would get our second step is 0 0.03 moles sucrose multiplied by the solute pressure constant that we have up here or a conversion factor of negative 0 0.23 and that would equal negative 0 0.069 and so therefore um, this is the, the I forget what the name of this Greek letter is called pardon me it just slipped my mind but the this is the pressure of water so I'm saying pressure of water and solute pressure. Oh, my spelling is so bad today. Um, water pressure on the other side of the tube, there was no water added, so we would say that the value of water pressure is equal to zero and we obtained our solute pressure from here and so the overall is just that 0 0.069 so we can see that our pressure is negative which means that water will flow from side a to side B.
it seems very much like that equation. Um, it's used as a partial differential equation, so it's more the Schrodinger equation has more to do with the concept, the concept of energy conservation, like kinetic and potential energy, which is equal to total energy, and this is more to do with pressure. Um, so that one, they, yes, I mean, they look the same. It's about adding two, like if we're talking about energy, we're adding energy to get the total, and we're adding water pressure and solute pressure to get the total pressure. So I, I would say they're similar, but I don't know if they're directly related. I don't know if they um, came about at the same time or not. And to answer your question about the negative 0 0.23, um, it says up here um, the solute pressure is always negative, and 0.1 molar of a solution of any substance have a sol has a solute pressure of negative 0 0.23, and so that was a value that we got earlier in the equation. And so that's why um, I put it right in here, because that is getting our solute pressure for the amount of sucrose. And thank you for answering that question because I'm pretty sure that we're going to use it again in the next one. And before I forget, I'm going to put the Google form in the chat. Cool, and let's move on to experiment B. A solution of 10 grams of soluble starch and 1,000 grams of water is added to side A. Assume the molecular weight of the soluble starch is about 63,000 grams. I know that they're not putting grams, but it is supposed to be there. An equal volume of pure water is added to side B. What will happen in the concentrations of water and starch in the two sides over time? Explain how this compares with the results in experiment A. So, in side A, we've got all this starch, and in side B, we have the same amount of water. Okay. So we're going to approach this pretty similarly. Um, we want to get the moles of starch when we have 10 grams starch over its molecular weight of 63,000 grams per mole. This is equal to 0 0.00016 mole starch. Similarly to what we did with sucrose, we're going to multiply what we got here Don't judge me, I still have to count my six six <laughs> moles times negative zero point two three solute potential, which is equal to four times ten to the fourth, ten to the negative fourth. And so Finally, um, similarly to what we did here, we just know that because our water potential is zero over here, that um, water is going to move from this side to that side, and I meant to put a negative here, sorry about that. Negative four times ten to the negative four is our negative pressure value. To answer the Last part of this question about how it compares with the results of the experiment in A. Um, 
the movement that we got in experiment A was equal to negative 0 0.069 for experiment B. It was this value right here. And if we were to divide negative 0 0.069 over negative 4 times 10 to the negative 4th, we would get that one hundred seventy-two point five. Um, that excuse me. Um, the starch will be moving one hundred seventy-two point five times slower than in experiment A. Number four, fertilizer generally contains nitrogen and phosphorus compounds required by plants. The nitrogen is often in the form of nitrates and the phosphorus is in the form of phosphates. Based on what you know about chemistry and water potential, why would over fertilizing lead to the death of the plants? Um, adding nitrates and phosphates to the soil um, thinking about adding just more stuff and more stuff to it actually decreases the water potential. So, nitrates and phosphates. And so when the water potential decreases, it may come to a point where the water potential in the soil is equal to the water potential in the root or is perhaps even less than the water potential in the root. Then water will stop flowing from the soil into the root. Um, if the water potential of the root was much higher than the soil, then water would actually flow out of the root which is very dangerous for the, the plant considering it needs water to live, transpiration would no longer occur, um, and the plant might unfortunately pass away. <laughs> okay, um, sorry, that's not funny. Decreased water potential in soil. <laughs> Okay, uh, number five. One of the most common ways of killing a plant is overwatering. Why does overwatering kill a plant? So, roots, like most other living tissues, require oxygen for cellular respiration. and overwatering may fill in those air spaces in the soil where root, root tissue can't access oxygen and then can't survive uh, because they don't have access.
Number five, B. If overwatering kills plants, why can't why can you sprout roots from cuttings of stems and water? Oxygen from the atmosphere can diffuse into the water of that jar and as a result the water can contain enough oxygen to allow for cellular respiration to continue in the roots. Um, further, if the jar is in the sun, then green portions of the root underwater can also photosynthesize and add oxygen. Um, but if the air spaces in the soil are narrow and penetrate deep, then um, and these are filled with water, then the surface area available is reduced. So the further the roots go down, the tighter the spaces in the soil, then that water availability is further reduced. problem. Thank you so much for coming. All right, number six. Xylem cells are dead when functional. Why must phloem cells be alive when functional? Um, as we talked about, xylem uses properties that don't require energy. Adhesion is not an energe energetically expensive process at all. Um, cohesion is not energetically expensive. It's just attraction between particles and water potential is also not energetically expensive. Water likes to move from higher to lower potential. It's, um, it does so without requiring living um, transport and that's why xylem is dead when water is flowing. But um, phloem has to be capable of pushing loaded sugars against their concentration and so that's why they have to have living organisms. I mean, it has to be living. They have to have a semi-permeable membrane. They have to expend ATP um, to push this energetically expensive process, and that is why they must be alive. Alrighty, number seven. Uh, so this is just a chart just basically um, looking at xylem and phloem and making some bullet points so it's just easier to compartmentalize, differentiate, and solidify the information. So what forces bring about a xylem conduction? Um, the major force is the negative partial pressure gradient generated in the xylem. And how 
of those forces are generated in the plant. So how is the force of negative partial pressure generated in the xylem is through transpirational loss of water at the leaf surface and other places on the plant um, which generates the negative partial pressure. B, flow and conduction. Um, the major force for flow and conduction is positive hydrostatic pressure in the cell. And how these forces are generated are by the difference in water potential in phloem versus xylem. Um, Sucrose is actively transported into phloem and this potential difference pulls water out of the xylem and into the phloem generating that hydrostatic pressure that moves the substances through the phloem. And to help visualize this, you can think back to those equations we did earlier in the sheet. Um, showing how if we have sucrose on one side, water on one side, similarly to how we might have xylem and phloem on one side, and we have all the sucrose on one side, and we have water here, and we said what is the, what is the difference in um, pressure, and we saw every time that water was going to move from the higher to lower pressure that was in the sucrose. Um, and so that is what explains how the difference pulls water out of the xylem into the phloem and then generates the hydrostatic pressure. Hydro meaning water. Uh oh, what is happening? Uh, my pen has disconnected. Technical difficulties. We'll see. I'm gonna try. Well, I'm gonna try to do this. Okay. No. No. Just give me one second, you guys. I'm so sorry. Oh, I got it. Just. I told you one second. <laughs> I accidentally pulled the tip out. Oops. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, the potential difference pulls water out of the xylem creating hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Cool. Alrighty. So unfortunately, I didn't have access to the diagram that it's talking about, um, but I did reference um, just a structure of an angiosperm, and um, and so yeah, it should be it should correlate just fine. But if you have questions about the picture specifically, unfortunately, I don't have access to it, so yeah. Okay, refer to your diagram of the cross-sectional structure of a typical angiosperm leaf from activity 34.1. Correlate the structure, that is the type and placement of cells, 
with the activities of the leaf as they relate to photosynthesis, water conservation, and food and water transport. Um, this is talking a lot about stomata, how they work and how they can differ in different plants, um, and also how xylem and phloem can relate to photosynthesis, water conservation, food and water transport. So when stomata are open, CO2 can enter and oxygen can leave. Oh no, CO2 can enter, sorry. Enter. Um, it's this water loss through the stomata that generates that transpirational pull on the xylem, which is what is pulling the water through the plant. Um, closing the stomata reduces that water loss, um, but it also reduces the amount of carbon dioxide available to the plant, and that's why we have things like C3 plants that, um, I believe, store the CO2 in a different compartment, and so they live in a lot of humid, hot areas where transpiration is relatively high, and they're losing a lot of water very rapidly, and so they generally don't like to keep their stomata open and risk that amount of water loss and so that's why they've adapted um, to closing sometimes um, but don't get also lost in the weeds in that that was just kind of an anecdote So there are two questions that are labeled eight. <laughs> so this is eight number two. <laughs> Sorry about that guys. Um, scientists have measured the circumference of trees at 2 a.m. and at 2 p.m. If they collect measurements when the ground has adequate moisture and the days that are sunny and dry, they to your question. Sorry. I just, I always get C3, C4, and CAM plants mixed up. And so I want to make sure Okay, so C3 plants, I think, are just the majority of plants, and it's like something that, the, um, basically a majority of what plants do. We, a lot of plants are C3 plants, um, and so they use those pores, they open the pores to the stomata, can do gas exchange, um, but something that they also do is they have an enzyme rubisco that um, it's, it's a photosynthetic enzyme that helps with the fixing of carbon from carbon dioxide. 
Rubisco is also really bad at its job. I'm also not going to get into the weeds of that, but it's called the stupid enzyme, which is really funny to me. Um, but yeah, so C3 plants are the majority of plants. They do things pretty normally. That's when the stomata open and close. Um, but what I was referring to earlier with C3 plants is that if the stomata are open all day, then they could use, they could lose it. And because they're porous, those C3 plants can close the pores of the stomata and reduce water loss. I hope that that helps. Cool. Scientists have measured the circumference of trees at 2 a.m. and at 2 p.m. If they collect measurements when the ground has adequate moisture and the days that are sunny and dry, they find that circumference and therefore the diameter of the trunk is smaller at 2 p.m. than 2 a.m. From your knowledge of the mechanisms of water transport, suggest the reasons that this decrease suggest the reasons for this decrease in circumference. Um, on bright sunny days where a lot of photosynthesis is occurring, the transpirational pole is larger than it would be at night, and so it would pull in the walls of the xylem vessels and contribute to the smaller diameter. Um, and so the pull in of the xylem and phloem, you can kind of think of like drinking a juice box and like sucking it a little too much and then it pulls in the sides of it because you're, you're creating this suction and that's kind of what's happening with transpirational pressure is that the, it's so great on hot days that it's all, it just pulls in the xylem. It's almost like sucking out of a straw. So that's, that's what I like to think about um, when answering this question. Number nine. Outline an experiment that allows you to determine A, how fast a substance is carried in the xylem, B, in what direction the substance flows in the xylem, and C, what percentages of solutes are in the xylem and at various distances away from the leaves or roots. As any experimental question that we ask, um, there's a bunch of different ways to design an experiment. Um, I'm going to kind of hark on an experiment that was already done by somebody smarter than me named Bruno Huber. And um, basically, because xylem is dead, you can insert taps or measuring devices into it without disrupting the function. Um, so to just kind of draw a picture, if you have your xylem over here, you can insert little, little measuring devices. that kind of, you know, cut into. And because it's dead, it's not going to hurt the plant. And what you can do um, to make it more experimental, you can make the distance between each interval the same. 
So we can say 10 centimeter intervals. I know that they're not drawn to scale, but we can just imagine that they're even. Um, and so what he did, um, the, the scientist I was talking about, is he actually added hot water and he, from heating the water in the xylem at various, and putting into the xylem, he could record at various locations of the branch um, when the temperature of the water changed. So if that hot water was flowing upwards through here, he could detect the temperature change in each of the gauges that he put in there. And so this tells you that the water in the xylem moved vertically by measuring the time it took and then, um, it, sorry, by measuring where the hot water flowed upwards, we determine that the water moves vertically and then by measuring the time it takes from that water to flow from this tube to this tube to this tube to this tube to measure when that hot water is detected, then you can also determine the speed of the transport. Cool. Um, we do have one more question and I want to give it some time. So I know that I just explained this experiment. I might save time on writing that whole thing out because I know you guys have incredible memories and don't need me to. Um, but yeah, that's just one way you can use an experiment for looking at the transport of xylem and, you know. Yeah, okay. Right. When researchers have tried to tap into phloem cells during experiment, phloem cells during experiments, they find that the disrupted phloem immediately stops functioning. However, aphids, um, which by the way, aphids are just they're insects that they're soft body insects that feed on, you know, the sugar in plants, the phloem in plants, basically. So that's what an aphid is. Um, Aphids can pierce through the plant tissues with their mouth parts, locate individual phloem cells, and once inside a phloem cell, the aphids essentially are force-fed phloem sap. If the aphid body is removed from the mouth parts, phloem sap will continue to flow and can be collected. You place two aphids on a, on a plant you are using for radioactive tracer experiments. One is located 5 centimeters above leaf A, and the other is located five centimeters below leaf A. So we can just say that there's a guy here, there's a guy here, and they're both five centimeters away. So that's what we're tapping into. So I'm sorry, I'm going to try to kind of condense this down a little bit so you guys can see. Um, you remove the aphid body so you can sample the phloem sap, sap from the mouth parts. You cover leaf A with plastic bag and inject radioactive carbon dioxide, so the 14 is just the weight, um, into the plastic bag. Leaf A is allowed to conduct photosynthesis for 10 minutes, during which time the radioactive carbon dioxide is continually supplied to the bag. You start collecting honeydew from the two aphids' mouth parts from the time that the radioactive CO2 is first injected to the bag and then every sec every 30 seconds thereafter for a period of one hour. If you analyze the phloem samples for 14C, where you would expect where would you expect to find it? I'm also going to add in this, though it's not written, that I am just going to be humane and not use the same aphid to shove into a plant every 30 seconds for an hour. Um, I'm going to find a nice hungry swarm and feed them each nicely individually. Anyway, so where would you expect to find that radioactive label carbon? Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't see that chat for the link again. Sending it now. Um, so that radioactive label CO2 would be used by the cells in the leaf to make sugars and photosynthesis. 
Um, the sugars would then be loaded into the phloem, and because the flow of sugars in the phloem is from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, so source to sink, remember how we talked about that, um, then we would expect to find the, CO the radioactive labeled carbon in the phloem sampled from the aphid mouth parts below the leaf. Um, so we know how, just drawing, how we kind of have this source to sink rule and if things are coming in, we're injecting the radioactive labeled here, then it's going to be flowing down because this is the source. This is the sink. I'm realizing now I should do this in blue because that looks like water. Sugar, I'm going to do pink. So, sink, source of DC14. And so, because it's flowing from source to sink, from higher to lower, and I'll just answer the question up here. The C14 is expected to be found below the leaf. Um, sugars produced by the leaves are needed to feed the non-photosynthetic parts of the plant, like the roots, um, because it's generated all in that leaf, um, that's why it flows from that to the bottom, because the roots are not photosynthetic. They can be, like we said, if it's submerged in water, but for the most part, they're not. They're in soil, and so um, sugars need to flow down to these parts of the plant that require that energy, um, and this region really requires a considerable amount of sugars. Um, if it were forming a flower and ultimately a fruit or anything like that, then it would be using a lot of that source of energy. Okay, awesome. Thank you guys for the, the person who said thank you. Um, cool. So, oh sorry, that wasn't trying to make everyone to say thank you. I just meant to, I just meant thank you to that person, not trying to cut myself off. Um, but yeah, okay, so this is the end of this one. So if anybody has questions, I will be sticking around. Make sure to put your own name in that Google forum so you can get the extra credit and stuff. Thank you guys so much for showing up. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I'll be here for another sec. Thank you. Thank you guys. Guys, you're so nice. Good night, everybody. Have a safe, have a safe night.